Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, for this chapter, we're going to be covering the applied exercises of the chapter on support vector machines. Uh, in particular, we will focus on this these problems over here, the fourth, fifth, and sixth. And it should be present also that some of the code uh, has been uh, not completely sourced, but maybe inspired in a way from the solutions from this specific public repository. Okay, so it's already going. Okay, so let's see. Apply the exercise for uh, and generate, generate a simulated two class data set with 100 observations and two features, uh, but we want that the boundary uh, with respect to, to this category is nonlinear. Uh, so because the, the decision boundary would be nonlinear, we would expect, for example, that this type of kernel, well, a support vector machine with this type of kernel, or perhaps even a radial one, would, be, would outperform a support vector classifier. So from this code, we can guarantee that, at least for this particular example. So let's see, where we simulate the data set. Yeah. Uh, an, an important part is that, at least for this code that I did over here, I, I never standardized the, the, the range of the numeric values. In general, you have to do it. Uh, however, because we are always sampling from, from how do you say, uh, from variables uh, which have a mean of one and a standard deviation of zero, it's not necessary to to re-standardize them. They are already they are already standardized. So for this particular example, I chose this data set uh, for which the radial kernel would would outperform the simple uh, support vector classifier. So this is our data. We split it between training and testing. Um, first, we, uh, and because we could choose really any type of support vector machine with linear kernel, uh, perhaps it would be kind of unfair to choose just one random one that we know is going to do a bad job for classification and compare it with uh, also a random super vector machine with a radial kernel that we know that it will probably do a better job. So so instead of just uh, getting a random model, uh, I choose this type of model and we, we perform cross validation to at least get a, a maybe fairer, more fair comparison between these two types of models. So we find the Support, support vector classifier. We do cross validation with five folds. Um, these values that we control for these hyperparameters, uh, it's also the, the same ones used in the laboratory. So in that sense, uh, this particular range, I, I don't really change it that much in, in this code. Uh, and once we perform this cross validation, the let's, let's call it optimal value that we find for the for this hyperparameter is C to have a value of 0, 0,001. Uh, and now, because we're working with this particular linear kernel, now, no, sorry, because, uh, because we're simply doing this validation via this function, then we can also get the, the, the best estimator via this function, instead of just defining this again, uh, changing over here the particular value found. You can simply extract it from, from this. I don't know if it's, it is an object. I don't know, from this variable. And that is what we are calling this cross-validation uh, support vector classifier. Uh, now, we do something similar for the other model. In this case, this support vector machine with the radial kernel. So we simply define it well, well, in, well in general. Uh, again, also cross-validation with five folds, really same range for C, uh, but because for the radial kernels, you have another hyperparameter, we also specify this gamma range. I think it's the same that they use for the lab. Uh, and then also scoring by accuracy as we did over here. 
we get this particular uh, optimal values for the hyperparameters, one and zero, zero point five. Okay, so now we have our, where we can call them optimal models. Okay. Well, no, optimal instances of these models due to consolidation. So, for example, over here we use this particular uh, model that we got and use it to calculate the confusion table. For example, what, what this classifier did is that uh, it really didn't split the plane in, in, in a way. It's it's like it it shows a whole plane instead of splitting it. Because as we can see from the confusion table, when we compare the predictions uh, with the actual values, we see that there is a match in all of the true cases. However, for the well for the negatives, uh, there is a complete mismatch. So in that sense, it did not uh, make a good classification. Um, and then we can do a similar test, but now not with the training data, but with the testing data. And we see a similar pattern that a complete match in the true case, but all the negative cases uh, have been incorrectly classified. And as we can see over here, these values are really, really small. Uh, these are the coefficients that define the hyperplane. And uh, I think that's why it's like, instead of splitting the plane, all the plane is being considered. So that's why you get this uh, over here a zero for false positives. And over here also a zero because every negative case was misclassified. Uh, however, that doesn't happen for this other uh, support vector machine. And let's see, uh, let me run the code. Um, over here we see that, <laughs> over here we see that uh, it indeed uh, performed a good classification. No, well, not even good, but perfect. So there are no uh, misclassifications, uh, not, neither for training data, and for testing data. But that's because I, I mean, I define the data. So, I mean, I, it's pretty biased for it to the radial kernel to work. Uh, and that's it for FSI4. Uh, we, we, in fact, uh, would confirm that uh, for this type of cases, uh, the nonlinear kernel uh, makes a better classification than the models that use a linear kernel. Now, for exercise um, five, so I do about... have one question. Yeah, I was just curious what were the different, like they had X's and circles or pluses and circles. Did those mean anything in particular? Uh, yeah, those are the support vectors. Oh, okay. 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 All right. Thank you. Okay, so let's see now, exercise five. Uh, well, we have just confirmed, like right now, the particular part. Uh, so, so now uh, we cover, I think it was one of the first things covered in the chapter. Uh, let me see. No, I think they don't do it. But well, well, it was idea that uh, for the cases of classification models, um, non-linear decision boundaries, instead of just focusing on some tool, some model or algorithm that out of the box works with um, non-linear decision boundaries, uh, we still had the tool that if we are restricted, I don't know, for some reason, maybe for interpretability uh, to the use of specification models that do use a linear decision boundary, uh, we still have the option of not uh, fitting the, the raw data to the model, but some transformation of it. Uh, in this case, I think we, uh, the transformation that we do, yeah, we simply square the data 
uh, and that is enough. This modification of the input data, at least for this case, it is enough to uh, to get now a very good uh, classification rate, no classification accuracy for this model. That uh, in particular we have been mostly been using it for this book in the case of li of linear decision boundaries. So so that's what we want to confirm over here. That a, a manipulation of the data uh, can still make these models useful. So the author, well, authors in plural, uh, they suggest this particular example. So we create some data set uh, where the decision boundary is not linear. So if we execute this code, and uh, where is our chip? Uh, I forgot to. Okay, for pandas. Okay, we this code, and now we, we, we graph this data. We well, leave the data, and simply the color is represented the particular class assigned. Uh, however, as we can see, it is pretty clear to us that at least the decision boundary is not linear. In, in a way, we can already see that. A type of hyperbola would be very good to, to, to use for the classification. And that's for parts 5.a and 5.2b. Uh, and now we fit this model uh, that at least by default is using a initialization boundary. First with the raw data to see that it's going to fail pretty badly. Uh, however, Instead of using logistic regression uh, with the same code that uh, we did in, in very previous chapters, uh, as I was looking at the code over here of this particular individual, uh, the way she does it, I mean, it's much clearer, I think. It's a fewer lines and it's still pretty understandable. So I'm going to be following that use of this particular moment. Uh, if, we, if we remember right, uh, how they used to do it in, in this book. I think they did J JLM and then using over here, JLM binomial. And there was also sometimes an inst over here, an instance of this. So I don't know, at least for me, it did get kind of confusing adding more things compared to R, for example, in R it's clear, e even though it's similar also using a binomial family over here. But I did find this way faster and it's, clear, it's still pretty clear. So we simply load this logistic regression model uh, from the uh, scalar model. Uh, and now we fit it with the raw data. Um, well, we can see the coefficients, but to, to take a look at the classification, uh, let's see, yeah, we can do the following. Over here, we're simply plotting for this data. What was the, well, the color represent what is the predicted class. Um, and we can see it failed pretty badly because this is a true class assigned. And not only is a decision boundary linear for this particular model, eh, well, uh, an input data, but the classification was very mistaken. As we can see over here in the confusion table for this particular case. Uh, we can also even, uh, let me see. I know maybe later, I think I do the code later. I, to, to calculate the exact accuracy, but I think I do that later over here. Okay, so that was the first part. Uh, using the model with the raw data. Uh, but now what I mentioned in, what I mentioned about modifying the input data uh, for the decision boundary not to be linear. In a particular case, because we know that the data was, was created in a, you know, let's call it a square fashion as they do this for the formula over here. Uh, in that same fashion, I simply square the data with these two predictors and now the model the same model is being fitted uh, with these square, squared values. So we do that. 
uh, they ask us to, to now look at the predictions for this case of nonlinear logic. Uh, and if we plot those, let's see. Ah. Well, first the confusion table for this model, and we can see now there are much, no, there are quite a few, no, now the errors are, there are only a few of them. In this case, only 20 cases of misclassification compared to over here where we had almost 300 misclassification, no, mis is a classified observations. And now if we compare these two graphics, as you can see, it, uh, let me see it over here, because there is a, a weird style over here. Yeah, for the, for the first case, uh, it failed pretty bad in the classification. However, for the second one, where we square the predictors, the classification is almost perfect. Only 20 cases have been uh, classified uh, wrongly. No. Miss, how do you say misclassified? Is it that misclassified? Yeah. Okay, so only, only 20 cases have been misclassified compared to what we had over here in the beginning. So in this region over here, there is a it's still a, a slight mistake. Um, well, and that's it for the case of using models that typically typically they have a linear decision boundary. Uh, now instead, now we compare that case of transforming the data to simply using the raw data, but with a model that I know, wait, wait, I don't know, we're still in the case of linear session boundaries. Uh, so for this support vector classifier, we are also in, going to see a quite a big error rate for the classification. So to keep the code similar, our input data, I'm going to call it X train and the response Y train, even though it's not really training because there is not a test, there is no test. But it's the only, only to be able to copy paste the code from the previous exercise. So we fit the support vector classifier. And similarly, five folds and the same range as in the laboratory for three. Also, I'm also comparing by accuracy. And what we get, let's see, it's a optimal hyperparameter value of 10. However, if we plot the, the 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 observations with the with their predicted class, uh, something pretty weird happens. I, I wasn't sure how to interpret this. Uh, how I mean this graphic. However, at least from what we can see in the coefficient table, uh, we do get a simple simple idea that the classification it didn't work right. For example, over here, there are more of these uh, cases compared to these correct classifications and such and such. And that is so expected because the decision boundary is not linear. So now we do work with a model that accounts for a nonlinear decision boundary. And now instead of working with a radial one, because we know that for this particular data, uh, the decision boundary, I mean, it has the same of, uh, sorry, the shape of a hyperbola. We would guess or, or infer that perhaps a polynomial kernel with degree two we do, would give us a, quite a good value for the classification rate. So now, still, we do the same type of graphical validation, but now for this other model. Uh, and as we graph the, the values for this optimal model that we found via the validation. Over here, well, I'm not sure if these are the support vectors or the misclassified. Ah, well, they have to be the support vectors, not the misclassified instances, because there are only two of them. 
but over here there are many points. So it, it has to be support vectors, uh, similar to the examples in the laboratory. Uh, but well, as I was saying, now there is this huge increase in accuracy. There are only two observations that have been misclassified. Uh, so now lastly, to because they ask us to compare now these four models used, yeah, well, we can calculate the specific accuracy. For example, for linear logic, that is, we simply fit the, the raw data to the logistic regression model. Oh, our accuracy was low. I mean, it's pretty close to 50%, but still we are in a binary classification case, so that is almost as good as those in a fair coin. Uh, and something similar happens with this support vector classifier. It's also a accuracy pretty close to 0 0.5, so it's still not quite useful. However, as we saw for the case of the nonlinear logit, in particular this quadratic transformation of the data, uh, it did gave us a quite high accuracy for the for the model. Uh, and something similar happens for this particular case of the support vector machine with quadratic kernel polynomial. It's not only a high value of accuracy, but even higher than the one from logistic regression. Now, uh, for exercise six, uh, in, in this case, uh, I will, for this exercise, I did uh, use more closely the, the code from, from here. But I don't know, I, I wanted to ask you that before going to exercise six, because I did make this change and I wanted to confirm with you if uh, what this person did was the accurate approach or, or what I presented already. For example, when we fitted the logistic regression model, but uh, transforming the data in a nonlinear way, for example, they do something like this. Over here. And over here. So this is my question. Uh, when we do this transformation of the data, simply squaring it and fitting it to the model, uh, which data we fit to the model is, uh, in what I did, is only these two squared uh, columns, well, and, their, and the response. But what she did in this code was using the original value, it's a squared value, and, and for the other predictor as well, it's original value and also it's a square besides the response. So which is the appropriate case or are they both uh, accurate? Do you know? Uh, Lucio, I would say that the approach that you took uh, you know, squaring each of the predictors and then fitting those transform predictors with the response, I think is the one, is the, lo lo you know, is, is the logical one. I will, I will have done the same way. Um, okay. okay. Yeah. I, 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 I don't know if it's different because what it is doing is dropping, Dro dropping the Y to that data frame. Yeah, she's basically uh, doing this one, right? X1, its transformation, X2, and its transformation. So these four variables and the response. Uh, the okay, yeah, I, I see what you're saying, that she included the original ones. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> that, that that's a good one. <laughs> but we can also do that. Yeah, uh, usually, I mean, Usually when I do my transformations, for example, if I do a log transformation, I try not to include the original one, okay? Because depending on the model, uh, there could be some collinearity issues between the original and the transform, you know, uh, you know, uh, feature. So usually when, when I, for example, I log transform 
a variable that is very skewed, for example. I I take, you know, when, when I'm modeling, I take the original and leave the transform just to compare, you know, to, to, to compare the original uh, with the model and then transform with the model. Uh, I usually don't include both of them. <laughs> So also, I, 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 I will do it like you did it the first time, that you transform your predictors and then you use the transform predictors, not added to the original data frame, right? Yeah, and also because at least for race integration, we also expect uh, independence, right, of the, of the predictors. Mm -hmm. So we already lost that, including them. Right. Okay. And and you could have a collinearity issue. That's the problem, because mm -hmm. logistic regression as linear regression is affected by predictors that are very highly collinear. Okay, you know you get an inflation factor, and that's why you know in that case I remove it. If I was using a tree base, maybe you could leave it there. You know it, it won't it won't really you know do do damage. You know do that much damage to the to the model. <laughs> Okay, interesting. So it has to be mostly if the particular model that is being used uh, right. has an issue with collinearity, right? Correct. If if it's affected, for example, you know, uh usually distance uh you know uh algorithms, what they call them, for example, linear regression, KNN, even uh support vector machine, you know, in the linear mode, uh polynomial mode, they get affected by that because you know they are computing the distance between that point and a reference you know it could be the mean it could be the 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 the, the support the support vectors etc if that calculating that distance that get affected by collinearity the three base they don't you know they don't get affected because they're not using a distance from that uh, that point to a reference okay they're using spaces uh, within within the universe of possibilities uh, you know, what you just said also make me think, mm -hmm. uh, for, for example, in this case, where we right. use this uh, kernel, sorry, poly, yeah, polynomial kernel, mm -hmm. we we didn't have to to re-standardize the data because it's the same. Right. Uh, so it's like it's saving us also a step that may be or not necessary. Yeah, you, usually where, where you where you want to scale the data is when the ranges in the predictors are really different. You know, for example, let's say uh, you're comparing age and, uh, you know, one one is the age and the other is the salary. So usually the age is going to be in the range, let's say, from 20 to 90, right? But the salary, it could be in a range from 20,000 to 200,000. So there you have to scale. You scale your, your data because the salary has a much bigger range than the age, and that's going to affect, you know, a distance algorithm, okay? But if they are in the same range, uh, you, you don't need to scale it. Okay, so thank you for the clarification. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, so that was my main doubt for yeah. SSI 5. So, so now looking at exercise six, okay, let's see, it says, uh, in a section of the book, it claimed that in the case where data is just barely linearly separable, uh, uh, SBC with a small value of C, well, that misclassifies a couple of training observations, may perform better on, their, on test data than one with a huge value of C, uh, which does not misclassify any training observation. So now we want to verify this for some particular data where it is also barely linearly separable. Uh, from, what, from what I saw online, like uh, examples uh, of, of data that fit this criteria, uh, what, the, the one that I preferred was the one also that she created over here. So that's what we are going to be using for this part. We generate data with two predictors um, and a response um, in a way that the classes are just, are just barely generally separable. So this is the way that uh, she does it with the repository. 
Well, if she changes this parameter, let's see if I change it to, to one. Now this points almost collide. I think they do collide. I know. I don't know when I change it if it collides. Maybe it was for a lower value. Yeah. But for this particular value, uh, I, I just like the way it looks. It seems to, to match the criteria or barely innerly separable. In this case, we have this, this line, this hyperplane. So this is our simulated data. Now, oh, there is a comment. When I went to select, okay, send you recording. Okay, so now, now we have for data, let's see, it says computer cross validation error rates for this core, well, for a support vector classifier uh, within a range of C values. This range is going to be the same one that we have been using across the laboratory. Uh, and now we're going to check how many training observations are misclassified for each of the considered C values. Uh, and what is the relation, relationship with the cross validation error update. So we specify this particular values of C. Uh, still we do cross validation and the main change is that uh, over here we also choose 10 false instead of five, only because if you use five, uh, the hyperparameter, I think it says it's one. However, if we do 10 or more false, it changes to I think it was 10. So in order to get probably the most accurate uh, hyperparameter, we are going to be choosing 10 faults. Also scoring by, by accuracy, but now we do want this data to, to be returned in this variable. So we do the fitting, I know the, the return value is one. So up, over here, if we choose five, I think it was 10. Yeah. Okay, so let's see if it. Okay. Uh, and this is, these are have the relevant metrics that this variable uh, outputs. Well, in general, it, it has a lot. For example, and it was CV results. All of these. Uh, however, the one that matters to us, to us right now, the results, the mean test score and the mean training score. And as you can see, they are a race of five elements because we are considering five particular values in for C. Uh, so now simply to, to get an idea, right, to compare these two arrays. Well, I wanted to do a simple line plot, but I, I know for, how to do it in Python. I didn't want to I didn't want to do it in plot line, so I I, I just use this graphic over here. No, I think it's okay over here. Okay. So let's see in this lower part we have the mean train score. And in the upper part it says mean test score. Um I, I did want to discuss this with you, all of you, because I, I didn't quite get a what are we measuring over here? Because, I mean, what is the score? Uh, and does anyone have any idea about this graphic? How can we interpret it? Uh, what, what, what is the metric that you're using in the cross-validation? Accuracy? Oh, accuracy. Yeah, that, that's the measure of accuracy. Okay, so I mean- For each accuracy. of the, for, uh, you know, for e e each of the, you know, instances. Oh, okay, okay, of each of the hyperparameters. Remember, it's, it's a mean because you're using a tenfold, right? Yeah. So each each hyperparameter is going to be used uh, in 10 different subsets of the data set, right? Yeah. Okay, because you are dividing by 10. And then those 10, they get, you know, uh, each one get, gets an accuracy score and then you average it. And that's your that that's your mean train score, or test score, depending on the data set for each of the of the hyperparameters, uh, you know, uh, uh, choices that that you you know, the hyperparameter uh, uh, choices that you uh, 
uh, you know, that you inputted for the cross validation. Okay, okay, now I get it. Uh -huh. uh, let's see. For example, over here, then we would have, uh, uh, let me increase the size. Maybe it is a bit clear on that. Okay. So, well, what was the optimal hyperparameter value that we found? It was. Yeah, I one. think for for five, for five it was one, and for ten it was, for ten it was one, and for five it was ten. <laughs> yeah, for ten it was one, uh, and one, that yeah. is the the second case. So in this case, right. it would be the second observation, and now we can see that is the case where the mean test score is the highest. And I would right. guess that that was the metric for which. Uh, this value was selected. Well, there are others. Uh, um, well, something else. I mean, you you get kind of mixed results here, you know, depending on the train and the test set score. Because, for example, in the second one, you know, in the one, uh, you get 0 0.99 and then you get 0 0.99. But when you go to 1,000, right, to the last one, uh, you really get a divergence there, right? Oh, the train yeah. score is one, but the mean test score is really low. That's why he's saying, okay, you know, the, the best one within, you know, this, that that difference between mean and test, uh, it should be there in between in one. Wait, so then what is the actual decision to, to choose this hyperparameter? Let's say given only the values. Yeah, it's it's choosing according to the cross validation parameter. It's use is using one or the other. Uh, what I would try to do, okay, because right now in the cross validation ten, right, you say that there, there's a parameter the 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 best hyperparameter is one, right? Yeah. But we're not sure, right? Because if we go to ten, we get a pretty good, right? A pretty good, uh, uh, you know. Uh, uh, test test and train score. Yeah. So I will I will say that the next stage in hyperparameter tuning will be between one and ten to see if there's something is there a parameter there maybe two five seven that it could be better than than one. Okay, so I will do like a second second iteration of of the hyperparameter tuning. Okay, but right now. He's choosing one because there's nothing between one and ten, right? It's just it's just one. So maybe if we do the same experiment between, uh, you know, choices between uh, values between one and ten, then we get a better a better hyperparameter, maybe. You just made me curious about if that's mm -hmm. the case. Let's see. Ah, there you go. <laughs> oh, it is five. Now he says five, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, over here, I think I only have to change this line over here for, for us to take a look at the graphic. Right. Um, I don't know, maybe. Yeah, that, that, that's not a match uh, parenthesis. Yeah, it's a parenthesis, the problem. Yeah. Uh, where is it? I think it's right there. Yeah. The one, the one on the top. No. Well, the other okay. one, yeah, that one, that one, the one in red, is not match. I th uh, it says. Uh, okay. Okay. Let's, let's... And now. Okay. And did you have to change the labels? Oh yeah, you're right. Yeah, the labels. Yeah. <laughs> How do I convert this to a string? Can I just do a string to array? Yeah. Okay, let's see. Oh, array can be, well, Python list mm -hmm. can be strongified. It's there you go. Okay. Okay, so, so, it, so now it's saying that five is the is the better one, right? Yeah. 
Okay, and you see five is the second one, right? Is the second second yeah. hyperparameter on the list one three five? So he's saying that that one is 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 your best choice. But I'm not sure also why that would be the case. Okay, you see five with the main range for is so low. I, I mean I know that. Uh, mm -hmm. that the score is going to wait more right uh, but it's right. still like for example five seven and nine no five and nine they also have pretty high mean test score well mean test accuracy mm -hmm. uh, but also for nine as we saw in the previous graphic there is also quite a high mean train accuracy so why yeah. not five or nine my guess is it wants to avoid overfitting Correct. I don't know how it's making the decision, but I think it's you don't want to overfit your training data. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so avoiding uh, a mean train accuracy that is too high. That would be yeah. a. Oh, okay, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, that, that was interesting. Exactly, because uh, if, if, you, if, if your train test score goes too high, then it's not uh, generalizing. Okay, yeah. you have to have a little bit of wiggle there. Maybe maybe that's why it's choosing instead of the instead of the the nine is choosing five. In that sense. Okay, same so, you all for clearing that up. Mm -hmm. uh, so now now we have. Well, the code was for other values, so maybe I would actually change it back just in case. Uh, let, let's let's still give with the hyperparameter value. Now I don't know if it was ten or one. I think it was ten. I know it it was one. Okay, it was one. Okay, so now let's see. Uh, six for six. Now generate an appropriate test data set. Uh, compute the test errors corresponding to each of these C values. And uh, now see which of these C values leads to the fewest test errors. Uh, and also do a comparison with the other two graphics. But now these three rows and one column. Are we going to see which C value yields fewest training errors and fewest cross validation errors? So, well, I copied the code in this part, so I didn't know how to generate the test data set. But it, it seemed that it was simply the same code as before, but we simply changed the, the seat. Uh, well, maybe to take a look at the graphic for, for us to see that it, indeed it is quite a good representative of as a test data set. It does look quite similar. And now we simply calculate the errors. And uh, for here, uh, we're changing these parameters that we chose in the beginning. Yeah, and simply calculating the accuracy. Okay, and now that we have to now that we have calculated the test error, now we can compare this. Now three rows. So mean test accuracy, mean train accuracy across the validation. Uh, and now the specific test error that we well that the that the cross validation was supposed to estimate. So let's take a look at the graph. Uh, let's see, we found that, I think it was one. Yeah, one was the value chosen. And um, as we can see, well, that is a second instance. And as we can see, for that case, it also happens that the test error is it's probably the lowest or one of the lowest across all the other C values, all, all the other C values that we have considered. Um, let's see, in order to, to answer in particular, let's see which C value leads to the fewest test errors. Uh, well, we can calculate it, but uh, I don't want to do it. So, yes, at, at glance, it seems to be this particular case. The same one as the one predicted via cross-validation of C equal to one. And then it says, in that case, how does it compare to the other errors? Uh, let's see, for this particular case, also the estimation of the, 
of the test error. And away. And over here we repeat, well, they are complements. Uh, so maybe I should do it in this way. Uh, Lucio, can you show us the errors, the test errors? Just the ve that vector? Okay, so first the test error. I wanted to do test accuracy for, for us to compare the graphic, but let's see, only test error at first. They're actually 0 0.0. Uh, let's see. They're pretty much. Okay. They probably have to add more digits, like more like digits after the decimal. Because there's probably like minute differences. How do I do that? No idea. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure. So, well, let's change this to error to test accuracy. So we can compare quite simply the, the other graphic. And we will test. So now it should be easier to interpret. Ah, I didn't want this. Okay. Wait, no. Ah, I didn't define it as such. Okay, so now, ah, there is quite a difference over here. In this case, the particular case of for C equal to a thousand, uh, mean test accuracy is quite low. However, the actual test accuracy is quite high. So any idea why? Any ideas why? I'm not sure. Well, there was one of the difference that we asked us. And then with which yields a few training errors. So now we should be looking at the second one. Few ways, well, also for the first one, the C equal to 0 0.1. No, wait. I know fewer errors, so higher accuracy. So for which, which one is the highest? So, thousand. yeah, we're here, yeah, 1,000. And over here, it seems also for a thousand or or for the hyperparameter value. Mm, okay. Well, I like I would like to know why this was different over here. But that was the main summary that we can do. Uh, I will <laughs> I'm glad that there is no more time because I also didn't do this two second two next exercises. Uh, so that would be it. Let's see, next chapter. Is there anyone signed up? We don't have anyone signed up. 